Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary this morning. It is great to see you all here this morning. We are here to worship and praise our great God. So would you stand with us and let's together sing to him. Those who are in Christ are bound for glory. So let's sing about that celebration today. in store. Amen? Amen. Why don't you find someone around you, say hi to them, and then you can have a seat. Well, praise the Lord. I am so excited this morning because you are evidence that we need two services throughout the summer. So praise the Lord for that, and we're so excited that you are here this morning and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a comparison to the first service. Are you glad that you are bound for glory? You guys win hands down. I had to ask them twice, but they got to wake up earlier. So, but thank you. It is. Isn't it exciting to gather together to worship the Lord and just celebrate that, hey, I'm bound for glory. This is an amazing thing. And so that's what we're going to do this morning is we're going to lift up the name of Jesus and we're going to celebrate his goodness to us. If you're visiting with us for the first time this morning, a special welcome to you. We're so glad you're here. We would love to get to know who you are. And so we're asking you to do us a favor. In between the seats is a blue welcome card. If you would just fill that out during the service. And then afterwards, if you go out in the lobby, look to your right, 
And you'll see a room called the Connections Room. Some of our pastors will be there. We have a gift for you. But more importantly, we just want to know who you are and how we as a church might be able to serve you and your family. Just uh, before I make uh, a couple of announcements, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, church family, for doing an incredible job of hosting our community last Sunday. Praise God for his goodness to us last Sunday. Incredible weather. Thousands of people on our campus rubbing shoulders with you and I, the salt and the light of the world. So thank you for being great ambassadors of Jesus Christ and his kingdom last Sunday. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. And with that in mind, I just want to ask quickly, if you were one of about the 128 people who were serving last Sunday, who sacrificed going to church, you're either serving breakfast, working in the parking lot, serving hot tags at lunch, cleaning up after spills, could you just stand quickly? We just want to say thank you. If you were serving last Sunday at Fire of the Gold, just stand up. Don't be shy. This is to give God the glory. Amen. Thank you so much. Continue to be in prayer for those who responded during the service that the seed that was planted, that God would make that grow. Well, I have an exciting announcement this morning. In the accordance with the laws of the province of Ontario, we published the bands of marriage between Annika Schumann and Matthew James Waddell, who will be married in Grafton, Ontario on Friday, July the 5th, 2024 at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. We rejoice in their upcoming wedding and pray God's richest blessings upon both Annika and Matthew and their families. So that's so exciting, Annika. And you can't judge a book by its cover. If you think Matthew's too young to get married, he's graduated university, he's a smart guy, don't worry. So we're excited for you guys. I'm going to ask if you are in this service and you graduated from grade 12 just this week, uh, please join me on the stage and Pastor Dan is going to join us as well. All our grade 12 graduates, give them a big round of applause. I'm sure there's a lot of tutors in our region going, thank goodness they are moving on. But thank you, gentlemen and ladies, for staying. They were here for the first service, and they're here for the second service. And uh, young people, if you've been listening to me preach during the series on Deuteronomy, one of the best tools for learning is repetition. And so I'm going to give you the same talk that I gave you at the 9 a.m. service. Great. Congratulations. We are so excited for you guys that you have completed. I remember my graduation in high school was in 1990, and uh, it was awesome. But then I got on a plane, left all my friends, left all my connections from Kenya, came to Canada, a whole new country to me. And you guys are going to experience some of that over the next the summer and into the fall. You're going to be going to new locations, meeting different people, forming new friendships. But uh, we just want to make sure that you remember the mission of your home church, and that is to enable people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's been our goal. Our goal while you've been in our care is to enable you and help you to become a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. You've had parents do that. You've had Sunday school teachers do that, youth workers. But now is the time you got to step up. You got to now take ownership of your walk with Jesus Christ. And when you move away, you got to make the decision, what am I going to prioritize in my life? And as we try and teach people here at Calvary, prioritize three things. One, one, one. Make corporate worship a priority in your life. Whether you're going away to somewhere, find a local church. If you need help doing that, call Pastor Dan. He'll help you hook hook you up with a local church in that area. If you're staying in, in this area, we look forward to seeing you continue to be here worshiping with us. But make corporate worship a priority. There's a lot of Sunday mornings You're going to want to just go, ah, it's been a busy week. I think I might just chill. No, go to church. Okay, you need it. Secondly, connect. Make sure that you connect with a small group of believers, whether that's from that church in their young adult program or whatever university or college you're going to, look for their Christian ministry on campus. Connect with them, okay, because we need each other. Relationships are the pipeline of discipleship. We need each other to move forward in the Lord. And then thirdly, reach. Worship, connect, reach. Make sure that you live out your faith in such a way that it's noticeable to people. You are the salt and the light of the world. And he is placing you on campuses around this province, maybe even outside this province, to be that light. So be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have to those who ask you and do it with gentleness and respect. At this time, I'm going to ask any of our children's ministry workers, if you work in children's ministry, please stand up. Either Sunday morning, Tuesday night clubs, just go ahead and stand up. If you work junior high or youth workers, yes, thank you. Thank you, Martin, okay. 
If any of the parents of these students are still in this service, could you stand up? We would appreciate that. Well, all your parents just bailed on church. I'm just kidding. They were here this morning. All right. Take a look around and remember how blessed you are. God loves you. How do I know he loves you? He has put people that, stay standing. He has put people in your lives to teach you how to become a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. Never forget those who have invested in you and thank the Lord for them. And so here's what we're going to do. This is why I asked you to remain standing, those who have invested specifically in these ministries that these students were a part of. I want to ask Pastor Dan to just pray a blessing over our graduating students. And as we do, those who have been serving with them, I'm just going to ask you to reach out your hand towards them, and let's just pray God's blessing upon them and that they will continue to grow as a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ wherever he is placing them. Pastor Dan. Dear God, we thank you and come before you in adoration and praise for you this morning because of the faithfulness that this group standing on stage uh, represents, the faithfulness that you have been to them, Lord. Thank you that this is a testimony, it is a witness to the fact that you are faithful to your people, that each of these students has a testimony that they can say they have seen you work in their lives. God, thank you for how you have provided for them throughout their high school years. Lord, you've provided academically, helping them study, helping them work hard for your glory, but far greater than academic provision, Lord, you have provided for them spiritually, through spiritual parents, through families that love you, through leaders at church, through friends who love you, Lord, ultimately through the provision of salvation, through your son, God, thank you for providing for these students. God, thank you for the testimony of the work that you have done in each of them that we get to praise you for this morning as we celebrate with them on this accomplishment of graduating grade 12. So God, we lift this group to you. And God, I ask that whatever is next for each of them, may you be the first and foremost one in their hearts and minds. May you come first before all else, Lord where there's lots of new things that are coming their way, perhaps new places to live, new friendships to build, new studies, new workplaces. There's lots of new, for some even new churches. Lord, may their relationship with you that you have begun in them, may that not change. Lord, may may their resolve to you stay firm and committed as they move on to this next season of life. Lord, may they put all of the effort that you give them into obedience. May they remember that your spirit dwells within them if they have a relationship with you. And because your spirit dwells within them, they have the ability to obey you. So God, may they steward that energy. May they steward that strength into full obedience to you, Lord. May they plug into a local church. May they continue to connect here and serve here if they're sticking around town. But if, they are, if they're moving away, Lord, may they connect with a local church early and may they connect with a local church deeply so that they may enjoy the gift of the church that you have given to every believer. God, may they stand firm on the ground of your truth at all times. In a world that seeks to deceive and give different ideas, Lord, you have given them the gift of being in environments where they know the truth. So, Lord, because the truth is within them, may they stand firm on the truth of your word, equipped with the armor of God that you provide to stand firm against the attack of the enemy. God, give them wisdom, give them discernment in all things, and may they be the salt and light wherever you place them, in schools, in workplaces, in families, in friends, Lord. May they make an impact for your kingdom as they continue to live faithfully and obediently for you, God. We love these grads. We know you love them, Lord, and we love you. So thank you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our grade 12 grads. Worship our great God through song, declaring that he is great, he is marvelous, and he is worthy of our praise. Let's sing. Spread. 
greatly to be praised. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Amen, indeed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord God, you are indeed a great God, the greatest, the only true God. And Lord, it's a privilege for us to, to gather together today and praise your name. Lord, I pray that you would help us today to remember your greatness, remember all you've done for us, remember your goodness and your faithfulness in our lives. And that would cause us then, Lord, to open up our mouths and give you praise today, even as we've already been doing, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for who you are and all you do in our lives, Lord. And that, Lord, is why we pray to you today. It's why we bring our requests before you, our concerns, our struggles, because we believe that you are a great God who can accomplish anything, a sovereign God who's in control of everything. So, Lord, today we lift before you those who are sick, those who need your healing touch today, Lord. We think of Arnold and Luba and Austin, Lord. Be with them. Be with Steve and Andy and Elsie and Gord and Carrie and Allison and Gladys. Just a few of those we know about, Lord, that represent many who are, are struggling with their health right now. Lord, I pray not only that you would touch them and heal them, but Lord, maybe more importantly, Lord, that you would keep their faith strong, that they would look to you for their help, knowing that their help comes from the Lord. Lord, we think of those who are mourning the loss of loved ones in these days. And especially today, we want to pray for Colin Martin and his family on the passing of his father, Sam Martin, and pray for Marcelo Coimbra and his family on the passing of his father, Dagoberto. Lord, loss is hard and grief is real, but you are the God of all comfort, the Father of compassion. And so, Lord, we thank you that even in the midst of sorrow and grief, you are at work. I pray that you would comfort these families and others, Lord, that have recently lost loved ones, as grief sometimes carries on for a long time. Lord, we think of those who cannot be with us anymore as they're once a part, always here at this church, regularly attending, but now age or physical limitations uh, keeps them from attending. Um, Lord, representing them today is John Trey, one of our shut-ins. Pray, Lord, that you would be very real to John today. You would minister to him, remind him that he is a part of your body, the body of Christ, and that he is not forgotten, not by us and not by you, Lord. You are with him every day. Remind him of that fact, Lord, that he would be encouraged and strengthened in his spirit. Then, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to minister outside of these four walls in our community. Uh, in our country, around the world, through our global partners. Lord, we think of Bill and Bonita Wilkinson today, uh, ministering with OMF, Lord. Be with them, strengthen them, encourage them, Lord, as they support that mission that does such a great work in East Asia, Lord. Bless them and strengthen them, and may the gospel go out because of their efforts. Lord, we think also of uh, the mission agency El, Jor El Jordan in Bolivia, uh, Lord, bless them and strengthen them and provide for every need they have, Lord, today and in the days to come, that they would know your power, the power of the Holy Spirit working through them, Lord, to reach lost people for you. Lord, we are a privileged people here uh, to be able to gather freely to study your word. I pray today as Pastor Calvin opens your word, Lord, and, and proclaims it to us, that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that he would preach your words, and that we would hear what you have for us to hear today, Lord, that you would bless the message, Lord, and that we would go out of here a changed people, knowing you better, knowing better how to serve you. And even now, Lord, as we continue to worship you in song and with our tithes and offerings, Lord, we pray you would bless them, use them to strengthen your church and your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus. 
our God done? God the Father sent God the Son to live among us a sinless and perfect life, to die a cruel and painful death on our behalf, and to rise again, defeating sin and Satan and death, bringing salvation to those who would call upon the name of the Lord. That is what our God has done. The Lord is our salvation. We're going to invite our children now to go to their time of Spark City, as well as our junior highs, and let's continue praising our great God, remembering that the Lord alone, He is our salvation. Let's sing.
is, our, is where our salvation lies. We are so thankful for the great sacrifice that you made by coming here, living, dying, and then rising again, making way for us to be in communion with God the Father. Oh, oh Lord, we love you. We celebrate you. We praise you today. And all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. I challenged our brothers and sisters in the first service this week to um, make it visible in your home some way, somehow. I'm an old school kind of guy, so I still use a lot of those yellow sticky notes. Uh, I know phones are great and I need to learn how to use technology better, but I just find slapping those everywhere helps me to remember what is important and what needs to be done. So this week, somehow in your home, whether it's through sticky notes, I challenge the first service, if you want to do it in toothpaste on your mirror in your bathroom, I don't care. But that may, that may take a while to do that. But somewhere put in your house where you will see it every morning, my debt is paid, the victory is won, the Lord is my salvation. Every day, put it somewhere and take pictures and send me pictures of where you stuck that sticky note or where you smeared that toothpaste. But this week, let us not forget our debt is paid. The victory is won. The Lord is our salvation. Isn't that great news? Amen. Well, this morning, I'm excited to be launching our summer series titled Alert and Ready. Live today with the hope of tomorrow. We'll be taking a look at two of Paul's letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, over the summer. And Paul's burden for writing these letters to the believers in the church in Thessalonica was to encourage them and to help them to know how to live out their faith in the sure hope of Christ's return. Quite frankly, we find ourselves in the same scenario today. Those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior live each day with the hope of Christ's return. But are we alert and are we ready? I remember the first time I took Kenny Blackburn and his son turkey hunting. It was a cold spring morning and they were excited to go hunting. They bought all the camo stuff. They had new shotguns and they were ready to roll. And so I took them out to where I hunt turkeys. It was a cold morning and uh, sat ourselves down. And I don't know if they thought it would be more exciting than it was, but they were shocked at how long I could sit still without moving, except for my eyes doing this over the field in case a turkey decided to take a stroll that morning. And I remember afterwards, Kenny said to me, my son was so spooked, Pastor Calvin. He wondered if you were okay. He didn't see you moving. And he thought maybe he's sick or maybe he's fallen asleep. No, I was totally fine. I was totally alert and ready. And if Kenny and his son had been willing to just man up and... Uh, fight the cold, stick around for 30 minutes more, they would have seen the reward of being alert and ready. And that's what Paul wanted the believers in Thessalonica to know. What does it look like? What does it look like to be alert and ready? And so this morning, before we dive into the content of Paul's letters, we're going to spend our time today unpacking the story behind how the church in Thessalonica even got started, so that we might learn some important lessons that will help us live today with the hope of tomorrow. So the circumstances around how the church in Thessalonica was started go like this. Paul was on his second missionary journey. And lives were being changed everywhere he proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ as Savior, including in the wealthy trade center known as Thessalonica. Thessalonica was one of the largest cities in the Roman world and was the temporary home of thousands of sailors, travelers, and immigrants who visited its bustling port and traveled its busy highways. Its vibrant economy, strategic harbor, and prime location on the Roman Empire's Ignatian Road made Thessalonica one of the most influential cities in the first century. 
In fact, it was made the capital of that entire province after Rome had conquered Macedonia. And it was also known as a free city in the Roman world. A privilege that not all cities in the Roman Empire enjoyed. In other locations, the Roman Empire had military occupation forces in those towns who set up their own government, but not in Thessalonica. They were free from Roman military occupation. They controlled their own affairs and political situations and could even mint their own coins. However, if the leadership of the city was not able to keep everything running smoothly, they would be accountable to the Roman Empire. And so the leadership in Thessalonica did everything possible to please the Roman Empire and its citizens so that it would not lose the privileges that it enjoyed as a free city. That's an important thing to remember. So during the time of Paul's second missionary journey, Thessalonica was enjoying a rapidly growing population. It had over 200,000 people who made up the city. Romans, Greeks, and Jews. As one author said, it was the New York, Houston, and Boston of its day. Yet for all its assets, it was a lost city. The Greeks filled the temples, the Jews attended the synagogue, and the Romans worshipped Caesar. But spiritual darkness covered the city. As Gene Green puts it, the Thessalonians were afloat in a sea of great religious pluralism and confusion. As I was studying this week and learning more about this place called Thessalonica, in fact, you can still go visit it today, and the travel guide will probably pronounce it Thessaloniki, and it has a population of about 815,000 people. But as I was learning about it this week, I couldn't help but notice the similarities between Thessalonica at the time of Paul's second missionary journey and the region that we live in. The Durham region has a rapidly growing population. We are a culturally diverse community, which is fantastic. But we are also witnessing a rise in religious pluralism and confusion. So with such similarities, it's important for us to understand how did Paul and his companions live in their day with the hope of tomorrow? Well, having personally experienced the saving and transforming work of Jesus Christ in their lives, they were absolutely committed to taking the good news of Jesus Christ as Savior to a variety of people that they came in contact with on his second missionary journey, including those who lived in Thessalonica. Made me wonder, does Christ's saving and transforming work in your life still amaze you? Or has this saving and transforming work in your life just kind of settled in? You know what I mean? It doesn't hit you. It doesn't impact you when you think of it as much as it did perhaps shortly after you were saved. Perhaps Paul's reminder of the wonder of Christ's saving work on our behalf recorded in Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 and 22 will help us listen to what he writes. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. My debt is paid. The victory is won. The Lord is my salvation. But if you're here this morning and say, Pastor Calvin, yes, absolutely, Christ's saving and transforming work in my life still amazes me every day when I get up. Then I would ask you the question, is that evident in how you live today with the hope of tomorrow? Because it sure was for Paul and his traveling companions on his second missionary journey. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. We'll be reading the first 15 verses, Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. 
as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on, the th- and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scripture, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-freeing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. And from this passage, an introduction to the church in Thessalonica, I want us to see three visible outcomes of experiencing Christ's saving and transforming work in our lives that should be visible in our lives. If you have experienced Christ's saving and transforming work in your life, then we will demonstrate, number one, a resolute commitment to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. How did Paul and his companions even end up in Macedonia anyway? Well, we find the answer, turn over one page in Acts chapter 16. Verses 9 and 10. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Are you, am I, really convinced that God has called each one of us to preach and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ? Listen to what Jesus told his disciples. He said to them in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And you might say, well, Pastor Calvin, that was him speaking to the 11 and that was a special assignment that he gave his disciples. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 to 20. Listen to what Paul writes. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, put up your hand this morning if you are in Christ. Don't be shy. Okay, this is the word of the Lord for you and I this morning. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, listen, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, us being anyone who is in Christ. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, we have all been called to go and proclaim the gospel. And as we read in the passage, Paul and his companions were so convinced from the vision that Paul had that they were called, that they got ready and left at once. They didn't have a prayer meeting. They didn't think, well, let's, uh, let's find out if this is really a, is this, does God still speak to people in dreams? No, it says they got ready and they left at once for Macedonia, arriving at the first city, which was Philippi. And you'll remember what happened there. Paul uh, led Lydia and her household to Christ and established a vibrant church. 
There you'll also remember Paul and Silas were arrested. They were beaten. They were put in jail. However, God miraculously freed them from imprisonment through an earthquake. And after they were free, they went for wings and had Diet Pepsi and watched Game 7 of the Stanley Cup. <laughs> Go Edmonton. <laughs> no. They were freed and what did they do? Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. They led the jailer and his household to faith in Christ. And after encouraging the new believers at Lydia's house, they left Philippi. As we, and as we read in the passage, Luke filled us in on where they went. They traveled 160 kilometers and ended up at a city called Thessalonica. And did you notice in verse 2 what Paul did when they arrived at the city? Very interesting words. As was his custom, Paul went to the synagogue. Even though he and Silas had just recently been beaten and jailed, they demonstrated a resolute commitment to go and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ where people needed to hear it. This is how they lived. As was his custom. How many of us could say it is our custom to regularly share the gospel with people who are walking in darkness? Or sharing the truth of who Jesus is with a lost person, something we rarely actually do. We've been called to proclaim the gospel. Listen to these convicting statistics that I found this week. A study done by Barna Group revealed that nearly one third, that's 31% of Christians believe they should evangelize. How many of you believe that it is our responsibility to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ? Okay, I'm glad to see as many hands went up as those who said, I'm in Jesus. That's good. But listen, even though 31% of us believe that we should evangelize, the stats say we have not done so at least within the past year. An April 2022 evangelism explosion study conducted by LifeRay Research found that less than half of self-identified Christians have at least once in the past six months shared a Bible verse or a Bible story with a non-Christian loved one, invited a non-Christian friend or family member to attend a church service or other program, or shared with a non-Christian loved one how to become a Christian. The same study also identified that almost two in three Christians, that's 65%, agree sharing with a non-believer how they can become a Christian is the most loving thing we could do for them. So what can we learn from the way that Paul was living in his day with the hope of tomorrow? Paul intentionally looked for connecting points. He looked for common ground that he shared with people so that he could leverage sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with them. As a fellow Jew, he had an open door to the synagogue to speak and introduce the good news of Jesus Christ up until persecution came. Because the synagogue was a place where the Old Testament law was known, it was revered, therefore there was a good chance that Paul, a fellow Jew who also knew and respected the Old Testament scriptures, could get a hearing. Don't forget also, Paul's commission was to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And there were many Gentile God-fearers in the synagogue, as we read in our passage, through whom Paul could begin his witness to pagan Gentiles. Add to this his great burden for his own people, and it is clear why Paul made it his custom to go to the synagogue first. He was intentional. He was strategic in where he went to proclaim the good news. What is your synagogue? What are your connecting points? Common ground you share with others that you need to leverage to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Brothers and sisters, that's what Fire Up the Grill is all about. It's not about fancy cars. It's about connecting points with people who are walking in darkness that I share in common with them. I'm not even a car guy. But I can go because I own a vehicle and talk to a car guy. Leverage that common ground. Leverage that connecting point in order to have gospel conversations with them. All of us need to commit ourselves to praying 
looking and leveraging the connecting points we have with others so that we can share the gospel with them. Listen to what Paul writes in Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer. Being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Paul was intentional. He was intentional to look for connecting points, common ground that he shared with people so that he would leverage those connecting points to be able to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to them. But also notice how he proclaimed the good news. He didn't go into the synagogues and start judging his fellow Jews or condemning them. No, it says in our passage, for three Sabbath days, he did three things. First, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He reasoned with them. Your opinion, my opinion, our wisdom, your wisdom, my wisdom is not going to save anybody. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. Meaning he engaged with them in meaningful conversation through questions and answers, always pointing them back to the scriptures. So what does that mean for you and I? If we're going to be resolute committed to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to be good students of God's word so that we can effectively point people to the truth because this is the truth that will actually set them free. And this is what Paul encouraged one of his traveling companions, Timothy, with. In 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, do your best. Did you do your best this week? Did I do my best this week? Learning God's word. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. He reasoned with them from the scripture. Second, he explained and proved that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead according to the scriptures. Paul laid out for them one Old Testament proof after another to help them realize that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. He explained and he proved who Jesus was. And then he personally proclaimed and announced that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, Paul was always careful to preach the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the core, the heart of the gospel that we proclaim. And as one author said, Paul's approach in proclaiming was logical, it was thorough, and it was unmistakably biblical. So for those of us who raised our hands this morning that we are in Christ and believe that sharing the good news of Jesus with a person living in sin and darkness is the most loving thing we can do for them, when was the last time you and I did the most loving thing for someone? Go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. To those who are lost and walking in darkness and listen, things will happen. Look at verse 4. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent woman. I can see the celebration right now. Oppa! Can't you imagine that? Many people believed in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and were saved because Paul and his companions had a resolute commitment to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Things will happen. However, something else also happened in Thessalonica. That is not uncommon when followers of Jesus Christ get serious about going and proclaiming the good news about Jesus as Savior. Opposition will rise. Look at verse 5. But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. I've been in a country and experienced riots. They happen so quick. 
and they can escalate to a level so quick that is unbelievable and it can be scary. But those who've experienced the saving and transforming work of Christ in their lives will demonstrate not only a resolute commitment to proclaim the gospel, but they will demonstrate a willingness to courageously persevere in proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, even in the face of opposition. Brothers and sisters, we should not be surprised and don't get discouraged when we face opposition for proclaiming the gospel. Don't be surprised. Don't be discouraged when you face opposition for proclaiming the gospel. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter 4, 12 to 16. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the suffering of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Doesn't feel that way, does it? But the Bible says, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. And as we read the excitement of the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks and the leading woman who embraced the truth of Jesus Christ in Thessalonica, it was quickly interrupted by an angry mob of envious, unbelieving Jews and evil men who had no interest in the gospel message. Why? Remember what I told you earlier. Thessalonica was a free city. Because the gospel that had come to Thessalonica why were they upset? It was threatening to turn their city upside down by challenging the authority of Caesar through the claim that there was another king called Jesus. One of the most serious crimes in the Roman Empire was to acknowledge allegiance to any king but Caesar. And so the truth that Paul and his companions were, were proclaiming about Jesus Christ was not only countercultural to the Thessalonians, but it was actually criminal. If Jesus is the true king, then Caesar was not. If Jesus was the only savior, then all the shrines and temples were worthless monuments built to worship worthless gods. If Jesus was in fact the son of God, then God must be real. And if God is indeed real, then they were accountable to him. The message of Jesus was therefore offensive to most of the Thessalonians. And it threatened the freedom that they enjoyed. And they were determined to mute the message and the messengers by whatever means necessary. Church family, I don't have to tell you. You and I both know that the same, that same gospel of Jesus Christ, which we still proclaim today, is still as offensive today to those who are living in darkness. Pastor Rick sent us <clears throat> on our pastor chat group See, I'm improving. I even know what to call them now. It's a chat group. Sometimes I get into it and other times I'm lost. But he commented on a podcast that he had listened to called The Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. And he shared with us this week, we are in a culture war that wants God dead in any way. They are determined to have Jesus just as they were determined to have Jesus dead in Jerusalem. That's the context we live in. Do not be surprised. Do not be discouraged when you proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and face opposition. You are blessed. The Spirit of God rests on you. But not only that, don't be surprised or discouraged when you face opposition, even if you don't proclaim the gospel, but simply for being associated with the gospel or its messengers. Didn't we see that with this gentleman named Jason mentioned in the Bible? Nothing really else is known about Jason in the whole Bible. He's only mentioned one other time, and that's in a greeting that Paul gave the Roman saints in Romans 16, 21. 
However, he was quite possibly one of the first converts in Thessalonica. And based on the statement that we read in verse 7, made by the angry mob who started the riot, Jason had welcomed Paul and Silas into his house and most likely hosted them while they were in town. That's why it says the mob, in verse 5, rushed. Another translation says actually attacked Jason's house. They didn't go there and say, uh, excuse me, Mr. Jason, we're just wondering if Paul and Silas are staying in your Airbnb at this time. No. They attacked his house, opened the door, went through every room possible in search for Paul and Silas. Second half of verse 5, they rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason, who has simply associated himself with the good news of Jesus Christ and his messengers, has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. Jason had to personally put up the money and the guarantee that Paul and Silas would leave the city and not return. Jason was a very new believer, but he demonstrated a willingness to persevere in his association with the good news of Jesus Christ in the face of personal opposition. You see, church family, whenever we get serious and, and have a resolute commitment to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to have three responses to our mission. First, some people are just going to get angry. They don't want to hear what you have to say. You're going to be accused of being intolerant for proclaiming that Jesus is the only way to God. Second response, in some context, people will escalate their anger to the level of persecution. Paul and Silas had already experienced that in Philippi. Around the world, untold millions of Christians live in imminent physical danger and many have lost their lives for the sake of proclaiming Jesus Christ. Just take a second and in your heart and mind, thank the Lord that we have the freedom to gather, worship, as many people as we want, as many services as we want. That's not the case for a lot of our brothers and sisters around the world. People will get angry. They might escalate to the level of persecution, but is it worth it? Absolutely, why? Because of the mission. The third response is, some by God's grace and enabling will embrace the message. They'll be saved. And they will courageously participate in the advancement of the gospel even in the face of opposition. We need to be courageous and do our part to support and invest in the advancement of the gospel. And I just want to thank you as a church family for demonstrating your love for Jesus and demonstrating your love for the advancement of the gospel to those who need to hear it. Thank you so much for supporting our youth mission team that is going to Quebec this summer. Praise God, they needed, I think it was 30,000, and we had to actually send a note out to the church to say, please stop giving. We're over 31,000. We're fully supported. Thank you. Thank you for supporting and investing in the advancement of the good news of Jesus Christ to those in Quebec who need to hear it. You might think, well, that's not as glamorous as saying maybe going to uh, Peru or Papua New Guinea. Listen to what I read this week about Quebec. Quebec is the province that is the home to less than 1% of Christians committed to an evangelical church. That's our country. Less than 1% of Christians committed to an evangelical church. Do you think it's wise for our youth to go to Quebec and share the good news of Jesus Christ and support that and invest in that? Absolutely. What am I excited about? Paul's ministry in Thessalonica was not a long one. Things happened by God's grace. God used Paul and Silas' resolute commitment to go and proclaim the gospel along with their courage and the courage of those in Thessalonica who received the message of Jesus and who then also persevered in advancing the gospel in the face of opposition. Lots of things happened in a very short time. Our youth are only going for one week to Quebec. 
Do you think God can change someone's life and encourage the church in a province where less than 1% of Christians are connected to an evangelical church? 100%. 100%. So pray for our youth as they go and proclaim that they will be courageous and persevere even in the face of opposition. When it comes to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ with others, I want to ask you this question. Who do you fear more? Those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul? Or the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell? Fear him. Pray to him. And ask him to empower you and I to be courageous proclaimers of the gospel. Paul was just an ordinary man who experienced the saving, transforming work of Jesus Christ in his life. Listen to how he asked the church to pray for him in Ephesians, just to help us understand he's just an ordinary man. Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador. I'm in Jesus Christ, Pastor Calvin. Okay, that means you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. That means I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Paul says, pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. That's my prayer for myself. That's my prayer for our church, that we will be a church that declare the gospel of Jesus Christ fearlessly as we should. Resolute commitment to going and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Courageously persevering to continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ even in the face of opposition. And thirdly and finally, demonstrate a readiness to take advantage of any new opportunity the Lord opens up to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the local Tim Hortons. That's our custom. No, they went to the Jewish synagogue. We need to be alert and ready. God will sovereignly orchestrate circumstances in your life and place you in the path of people who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We saw, I don't know how many grade 12 students here today. They have with their parents' wisdom, counsel from others, pray, sought the Lord for answers. They are all going to different destinations potentially for post-secondary education. But I pray that their mind and their eyes and their heart would be blown up to see... (laughs) It was so much bigger than this school had a program for me. This school was a good fit for me. This school was affordable. It was close to home. No, no, no. God is orchestrating the circumstances in every one of those grade 12's lives who are in Christ Jesus and placing them in locations and campuses around our province so that they might share the good news of Jesus Christ with those that he places in their path. And even though Paul and Silas escaped potential persecution in Thessalonica, you need to understand it was no doubt difficult for Paul to leave the city. Why? Why would you say that? He, he wants to stay there and get beaten up and put in jail? No, here's why. Because a true shepherd is driven not by personal ambition, but, pa- but by pastoral concern. He may have escaped the persecution of the angry mob, but he could not escape his concern for the new believers he left behind. However, Paul did not allow his circumstances, what he was feeling, to cause him to lose hope or shake his resolute commitment to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why when they arrived in Berea, he did what was his custom. He went to the Jewish synagogue. Paul was ready and committed to take advantage of this new opportunity which the Lord opened for him to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to more people who needed to hear it. And what did they discover there? A group of Berean Jews who were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And look at verse 4. As a result, sorry, verse 12. As a result, many of them believed 
as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Opa! There it is again. He simply proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. He was courageous. They were courageous. And things happened. Things happened. In your effort to reach those who are walking in darkness, can I encourage you, stop, focus on trying to save people. We cannot save anybody. Focus on planting the seed of the gospel and then watering it knowing that it is God who makes it grow. 1 Corinthians 3, 5, 7. The believers there were arguing who, who they're following. I follow Apollos. I follow Paul. And Paul says, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom he came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. Listen, but God has been making it grow. I have to just tell you, you're the second service, so we can go a little over time. I have to tell you the story. Phil Powers invited someone to fire up the grill 10 years ago. And that gentleman came forward and received Jesus Christ as his Savior that day. And then Phil Powers lost all contact with this individual. Two weeks ago, he gets a text out of the blue from this gentleman. And this is all the text said. Phil, you were right. In God, we trust. Seeds planted watered 10 year span God's making it grow so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow so don't be afraid to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ you don't have to save I don't have to save nobody we just have to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ this week my wife came home uh, one day and she said, you won't believe what happened today. My wife is the property manager of Whitby Christian Nonprofit Housing. It's a complex in Whitby. And uh, she said, I was in my office and this lady, one of the tenants came up and uh, this lady's lived a terrible life and she has a terrible life. And she just started to share the mess of her life with Jen. Jen knew she wasn't equipped with the answers to help this lady and all that she's dealing with. But as she was sitting there listening, Jen looked on the shelf and she saw the book of John. And she said, the Spirit told me, give that lady the book of John. So Jen courageously said to this lady, I don't know if you have any religious background. I, I'm not able to answer all the issues and the concerns that you're going through. But I know someone who who can answer all your problems. His name is Jesus. I want you to take this. I want you to read it and learn about who Jesus is. Yesterday afternoon, I left my office. I went home and I said, Jen, do I have permission to share how you took advantage of an opportunity that God gave you and were courageous knowing you can't answer this lady's questions? She said, yeah, and do you want to hear an update? I said, oh, sure. Yesterday afternoon, that lady texted Jen. She's never been to church once in her life. Right beside their complex is a Bible-believing church, good church. And she texted Jen and said, do you think it would be okay if I went up to the church tomorrow? I want to learn more about what I've been reading in the book of John. Jen said, absolutely. Here's what you're going to experience. You're going to walk in. People are going to say hi to you. There's going to be singing. Just let her through what she's going to experience. And we're trusting that she went this morning. And the seed that was planted was watered by that church today, and we trust that God is the one who will do the growing. Don't miss out. Don't miss out on the privilege God gives us to be part of his saving work in people's lives. But remember, do not be surprised or discouraged, because when by faith you start to become courage, courageous, opposition arises. Verse 13, but when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. And so folks, from this look into the story behind how the church in Thessalonica was established, we can see that God uses ordinary people whose lives have been touched by an extraordinary God. We see that the gospel is still the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. 
God's power through the proclamation of his word changed lives. And a church in Thessalonica, listen, was founded in less than a month. <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable? Ordinary guys. In the face of opposition, did what they knew what they could do. I'm going to share with you the knowledge of who Jesus is. Lives were changed and a church was established in a month. Made me think, what might God do through Calvary Baptist Church in the region, Durham region, over the years? I'm grateful for what he's doing, but folks, I am burdened. There is so much more that I believe God can help us to do. And then finally, we see that Satan is always at work, scheming how to oppose the advancement of the gospel. Be encouraged. Jesus has already announced that he will build his church and the gate of Hades will not overcome it. So, how should we live today? With the hope of tomorrow. Here's where we can start. Go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Be courageous to persevere in proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ even in the face of opposition. And always be ready to look for new opportunities that the Lord opens up to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And if we obey, things will happen. Father, thank you so much for your word to us this morning. Thank you for helping us to be encouraged to see how the church in Thessalonica was started by ordinary people who had experienced your incredible saving and transforming work in their lives, recognized the calling on their lives to be ambassadors of your good news, and then courageously went out in the face of opposition to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And what happened? You changed lives. You established churches. God, I pray that we would be individuals and I pray that we would be a church who is faithful to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do in our lives as you continue to enable us to be more courageous, as you open our eyes to see connecting points, new opportunities, doors that you open so that we can proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. I know there are many lives in this city that you long to change and transform. God, we don't want to miss out on the opportunity of being involved in your saving work in people's lives. So please, Lord, help, help us to be alert and to be ready for your service. You are our King, Jesus, and we love you. And we trust that it will be evident through the way we live today with the hope of tomorrow. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, church, would you stand with us? Let's together declare that we will be obedient to whatever God calls us to, to whatever mission field that he calls us to. Let's sing today.
his traveling companions heard the call of our captain Jesus Christ and they responded the question that the Lord has put before us as a church family today is will we respond folks we live in a region with a rapidly growing population culturally diverse religious pluralism many of our people in our community lost and confused will we this week do the most loving thing we as Christians claim we can do for an unbeliever and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them do you realize each one of us who are here today who are in relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ are here because you heard the message from someone someone spoke and proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ who in the days ahead We'll be worshiping our Savior by God's grace through our obedience to do the most loving thing we can do and go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And as we embark now through the first and the second letter that Paul wrote to that church that he left in Thessalonica, still in persecution, in a hard, harsh environment, we will see how God's Spirit through his word and through the local body of believers will strengthen us through the difficulties of life to live today with the hope of tomorrow. Church, will we arise and will we shine? Only history will tell, but I sure pray so. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.